All right, everyone. Thank you very much for being with us today. My name is Alex Burney, and my colleague Larissa Green's on with us. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Just remember that all audio on your end has been muted, so do make sure you type in any questions that you have into the chat box, and we will address these as we go forward. But I will let Larissa lead us off, and then we're kind of going to go back and forth, but just make sure you ask questions as they come up. And let's go ahead and get started. Larissa, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, just a little bit of um, housekeeping here, too. We also do have the slides added to the handouts box. So if you look at your right hand navigation for GoToWebinar, you're going to see an option for handouts. And on there, you're going to find the PDF of the um, slides. So if you did want to download them and follow along, you certainly can do that. If you have any issues with that, you can always email Alex or myself later on, and we'll make sure to get the slides over to you. Um, so you see some information about Alex and myself up here um, for, just for you guys to kind of know who you're talking to, know, know about your presenters. Um, Alex has been with our team um, for just about as long as I have. We both started working for Advanta in 2011. I think I'm just a couple of months ahead of Advanta and we both do business development, but both of us started out doing different things for Advanta IRA. So we are very, very aware. We have a really good understanding of all of the stuff that goes into a self-directed IRA, including things like new accounts and transfers, transactions, billing, everything that sort of makes up our business, Alex and I have done at one point or another. Both of our contact information is here for you on the screen. So if you'd like to reach out to us after the webinar, please feel free to do so. Sometimes we run out of times for questions, or maybe your question is one on a more personal basis, and we can certainly address those outside of the webinar. Advana IRA doesn't provide any investment, legal, or tax advice, so please keep that in mind. We are going to talk about self-directed IRAs and the rules for self-directing, but when it comes to your investments, you want to make sure that you understand the rules, that you consult your attorney or your, um, your tax advisor and really understand about the investments that you're getting into. Make sure you do any due diligence because Advanta does not do, in, do any due diligence at all on investments. We don't ensure guarantee investments. Once your money comes over and you make an investment, your investment is your own. And so you definitely want to um, go back to your team and of professionals and talk to them about the investments you're making and make sure you understand them. Okay, so some key takeaway points here. And like I said, Alex and I are gonna talk about the rules. We're gonna talk about structures of investments that we've seen. We're gonna give you some examples and sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. So we like to talk about the key takeaway points for any webinar and just keeping in mind any IRA or former employer plan qualifies to self-direct. You choose the investment. Remember again, Advanta does not sell anything. We simply provide a service where we hold the account. So we hold the account, you find the investment, we'll help you get it done in the name of the IRA. And then all expenses are paid by the IRA related to that investment. And any income is received by the IRA for that investment. So we're gonna show you some specific examples of how that works and how Advanta is involved versus what your role will be when you're making investments through a self-directed retirement account. Absolutely, Rissa. Thanks. And again, just a little bit of the housekeeping for today. Here's kind of what we want to kind of cover in order. So if you're taking notes or if you're just someone that likes a little bit of an agenda. So we've covered what Advanta IRA is here in a second. We're going to go through what a self-directed IRA is specifically because it's important to understand when looking at this, you know, kind of getting a good face, understanding, you know, what exactly is a self-directed IRA because there are uh, you know, larger brokerages out there that will say, hey, you can self-direct this IRA. Well, in the context of what we're talking about, it's going to be truly based just on alternative assets. And while real estate, at least in my opinion, or lending on real estate certainly is not an alternative by any stretch of the means, in general, the context, if you're doing research and doing your homework, this is what you're going to need to do to utilize for alternative assets in your retirement plans. We're also going to go over the types of assets and accounts that you can hold through these because the IRS has a Basically, they find it easier to tell you what you can't invest in than what you can. So we're going to kind of go over, again, as a 30,000 foot view of, you know, what you can invest in and what type of an accounts. We're going to go through the basics of private lending and we're going to get into some case studies so you can actually see how this stuff is actually functioning when it comes to using IRA funds to lend to someone. Are you lending to someone on a real estate project? Is there other types of collateral? Is it unsecured? Are there, uh, you know, things like convertible notes? All sorts of cool and interesting stuff can be done in the context of private lending, and we're going to cover that in the case studies at the end. A little bit about Advanta. So we're very proud that we've been in business now coming up on our 20th anniversary. So 
Uh, you know, we've been, you know, we've been at this through several different market cycles and, you know, we've definitely persevered and have a very good and polished product and service that we like to offer to our clients. And that's what we like to really hammer home to people is that our focus first and foremost is the customer service aspect. You know, there certainly are other companies out there that do what we do, but we like to focus on the customer centric first, uh, meaning that we provide dedicated account management to every single one of our clients. You don't have to be a $5 million client to have a dedicated account manager here. If you have a $5,000 account up to, you know, whatever, with the size, the limit, you always have a dedicated point of contact to come, to reach out to, to process your investments, to take care of everything. And that was kind of where I started my career here at Advanta was doing that direct client account management. And I've seen just how uh, additionally, successful it can make people when you have that direct line of contact to get questions answered so again we're really proud of that additional things about advanced ira just because you're doing an alternative investment or doing something you know outside the norm not stocks bonds and mutual funds doesn't mean you're giving up any type of security on your uninvested cash all uninvested cash is fdic insured up to applicable limits and another fact that we're really proud of is that we've crossed over the threshold to it uh, and I'd like to see the number currently, uh, but we have about $2.5 billion worth of assets under administration for our clients, which uh, just goes to show that you know, the, the trust and the product that we have to administer these assets for clients and to help our clients be successful with it, we have, certainly do have a lot of those types of assets. Uh, now we're going to get into what exactly is a self-directed IRA. Now, a lot of people, you know, you might have heard, again, I said that you know, some larger firms talk talk about things that are self-directed IRAs. And while, yes, you certainly can go out there and pick a stock or a mutual fund at your own leisure, the term self-directed IRA in the context of what we're talking about and in the broader sense really focuses on accounts that you can utilize for investing in alternative assets. Now, alternative assets basically are just anything that is not a stock bond or mutual fund. So just keep that in mind. And the reason that most people haven't necessarily heard about this, you know, thinking, hey, you know, why am I only now hearing about this? Is this something that just came up? Is it going to be legislated out of existence that, hey, I can no longer do a mortgage loan out of my IRA? It's simply not the case. The IRS basically gave us a list of things that you can't invest in, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. But the boiled down version of that is that the IRS says, hey, so long as that the financial institution is willing to hold the type of asset that you would like to hold, they can do it. So banks jumped on board, brokerage houses said, hey, you know what? buy some stock, buy Coca-Cola, buy IBM, buy this mutual fund, and we'll just hold your IRA. And, you know, granted, that is a very direct and, you know, quote, easy way to do it. But again, there's definitely not as much of a market for people and service providers to go out there and say, hey, you can do this. You've been able to invest in alternative assets within an IRA since 1975. IRAs were legislated in 1974, and in 1975, when they came out and financial institutions could offer them, you can you could do it since then. So there really you know shouldn't be any fear that you are not able to do this kind of thing. This is definitely well well established in the fact that you can do these types of investments. And just to kind of give you some you know information on maybe why you haven't heard about this, the retirement plan industry, if you will, or let's just say the retirement plan assets in the United States are somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty to thirty trillion dollars worth of plan assets in the United States. And by our best estimation, 4% or less of those assets and accounts are self-directed. So it's just a much smaller market, uh, but it's important to understand kind of, you know, where this stuff lies and, you know, maybe why you haven't heard about that. But again, that's maybe why you haven't necessarily heard of a self-directed IRA up until now. And I'll get this slide to advance. There we go. So let's see, types of plans and assets. So types of plans that you can self-direct. Basically, almost anything that's a retirement plan but you know i have a few up here that aren't necessarily retirement plans per se but you can still self-direct which are very interesting indeed well let's start from the left hand side and kind of work our way over the most notable of all these types of accounts is your traditional ira it is by far and away the most common type of individual retirement plan in the united states it is pre-tax meaning that all the money that goes into it has not been taxed yet, you pay taxes on the distributions you take in retirement. You don't have to worry about capital gains, you don't have to worry about any other of the type of taxes coming in. And the interesting thing is that basically all of these plans with regard to income coming in from your investment, so if you were to lend someone a mortgage note, all of the interest is not taxed at that time. If you were to have a payoff, if you were to sell a piece of property, if you're selling stock, all that stuff is basically taxed the same at the transactional level whether it's a Roth or traditional or any other type of plan. 
but I'm getting a little ahead of myself, the traditional IRA, again, what most people have, because a lot of people have participated in things like 401k plans, 403bs. If you're a governmental employee, something like a 457 or the TSP, most of those plans are going to be pre-tax. And when you sever service with your old employer, most people roll it into a traditional IRA. So that way they can more accurately and to their own strategy, direct their investments of that plan. So traditional IRAs, 100% can absolutely be utilized to lend someone a mortgage note, to lend someone money, or to do any type of alternative investment. Now the Roth IRA, a very, very powerful tool, but something that comes with a little bit of baggage in my opinion, because some people are under the assumption that say, hey, I wanna do this investment, but you know, my buddy or my friend told me that you have to have a Roth IRA to do it. While a Roth IRA is very nice, and I'm under the opinion of paying no tax is better than paying any tax, it's not required to do any type of investment. You can do the same type of investment in a traditional IRA as a Roth IRA, as a simple, as a health savings, as an education savings account. But Roth IRAs have the added benefit of that you've already prepaid your taxes. So you pay all your taxes going in and then you pay a whopping zero tax in retirement, which again is pretty cool. But again, going to illustrate that you don't necessarily have to have one of these types of plans in order to do any type of self-directed investment or at the very least, a lending type of structure. You can also lend out of small business plans like the STEP IRA, the Simple IRA, or one of my personal favorites, the individual 401k plan, uh, which are very, very interesting uh, types of plans because it takes all of the contribution limits and <clears throat> other types of retirement plan, uh, employer plan benefits, and distills it down to something that is utilized for a self-employed individual or an owner-operated business. You can also self-direct your health savings account. I personally self-direct my health savings account. Uh, they are very, very interesting plans. Now you do have to qualify for a health savings plan. Not everyone can just open up one, but if you do have qualifying high deductible healthcare coverage, you can have a health savings account that owns real estate or something that you know lends someone a first position mortgage or did a debenture note or an unsecured note for that matter. You can do that kind of stuff out of a health savings account and also do a much lesser utilized type of plan. Also, education savings accounts can be self-directed as well. Um, before I get to the next slide, I see a question popped up. Is there any difference between a Roth and traditional IRA for uh, in the context of lending? Uh, no, not in the context of doing the investment itself. The only difference basically is just when you take a distribution in retirement, um, you know, uh, over 59 and a half, whether or not you're paying income tax on the money you take out of the IRA or not, being Roth, you pay no tax, traditional IRA, you do pay tax. It's a great question. And make sure that, again, you just keep those questions coming up, we'll answer them throughout the presentation. Now, up here, we have enumerated the, the contribution limits for retirement plans as of 2023. Not a whole lot changed from last year. We got a, another small increase into the amount of traditional and Roth IRA contributions. So it's now up from 6,000 and 7,000 to 6,500 and 7,500 if you're over the age of 50. SEP IRA has got a COLA adjustment as well. So up to $66,000, you're up to 25% of your top. Simple IRAs, which are a terrible acronym for a relatively complicated plan, went up as well uh, from 13.5 to 15.5 of salary deferral, an additional 3,500 if you're over 50. And then the employer matches as well. 401ks, again, got a small bump on the salary deferral portion of it. And you can contribute a maximal amount of up to about $73,500 into those plans. The ESA, which gets overlooked constantly with the cost of living adjustments, has still been pegged at $2,000 a year per year per child. And health savings accounts got a little bit of a bump to $38,500 if you're on an individual high deductible health care plan with a $1,000 catch up. Or if you are on a family plan, a $7,750 contribution limit as well. And before I turn it over to Larissa, let me just answer this last question that came in. Uh, let's see. Uh, can your business provide a match with the self-directed 401k? Yes, I would. Yeah, that's a little bit of a more of a complex question to answer. I would say that it's kind of best to either reach out to Larissa or I to kind of go through that because I teach a whole hour long plus class just on how that stuff works. So not to get too far into a rabbit hole here. And one last question. Are you able to contribute? Uh, let's see. Are you able to contribute to your existing 401k with your W-2 job and still contribute to a traditional or Roth up to the limits of the slide? Yes. 
you can contribute both for the same year, but your deductibility might be an issue. And I promise, last question, for 401k, can I borrow against that? Yes, 50% uh, of your vested balance are up to $50,000 with a five-year repayment period. And with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, so now we're gonna just talk briefly about the investments that you can make within a self-directed IRA. And earlier, Alex mentioned that the IRS has given us, instead of saying, here's a list of investments you can make, they found it easier to give us the list of investments that you can't make and people you cannot transact with. And we'll talk about that briefly as well. But since we're talking specifically about private lending today, some of these asset classes are going to tie into that. So, of course, when you're lending money, you could do so um, tied to real estate. So you can lend with a first mortgage or a second mortgage or even a third mortgage. It could be... Um, also something where you're lending money unsecured or secured by another asset altogether, something um, unrelated to real estate. And so we do just like to put this out there, kind of get your wheels turning. So you can see the different asset classes that Advanta has seen in the past. And actually, we do a whole webinar and we have it coming up on the unique side of self-directed IRAs. So we talk a lot about real estate assets, but that's not all that we see at Advanta. So we're gonna start with the real estate side, single family homes, of course, and you can literally go and buy 123 Main Street in your retirement account. You can um, rent that property out long-term and have that rental income come back to your IRA. You can rent it out short-term, so a vacation rental, for example, and that income would go back to your IRA. You can do rehab projects in your IRA, and Something really cool, it does not have to be a single family residence. It could be a condo, a mobile home or a mobile home park. You can purchase at tax deed auctions. You can invest in real estate investment trusts or REITs as they're commonly referred to. We see people make real estate investments into syndications and private placements. And those types of investments are another way too for people to get involved in real estate and maybe have a more passive um, role in that investment. So there's a lot of options when it comes to real estate investing. This is what we kind of consider the paper side of self-directed IRAs, but of course I mentioned mortgage loans and we're gonna talk more specifically about that coming up here soon. Um, we see people invest in tax liens. So actually here in Florida, we just passed tax lien season. It's around May, at the end of May, where um, counties put their tax liens up for auction and people bid on those tax liens and then hold them in their retirement account. That's a really cool investment because it doesn't take a lot of money to make an investment into tax liens. So you can start with just a couple hundred dollars in some cases up to a couple thousand dollars and maybe even tens of thousands of dollars but of course it depends where the property is located and what the taxes look like in that area but that would be related to real estate taxes and you know how you invest in tax liens and tax deeds will largely depend if you are a tax lien or a tax deed state and if you're if you are curious about that and you have more questions please reach out to me but that's an investment that we do see in a self-directed IRA. I mentioned unsecured notes, and we do hold a lot of unsecured notes at Advanta. Those tend to be more to businesses rather than to individuals. Um, and remember at the beginning, we talked about Advanta doesn't do any due diligence. We don't insure, guarantee your investments. And when you're making any investment, not just unsecured notes, but any investment, you wanna make sure that you understand the investment. And if your borrower should fail to pay, how could you recoup your losses? And so that would be a question, again, for your attorney and your tax professionals to help you with that. But I think a lot of times when we see something that you know says unsecured note, we tend to think, okay, well, what would you do in that case? But just keeping in mind that any investment you make, you should do your due diligence on. We do see debenture notes and option contracts. And option contracts are interesting because a lot of times at Advanta, we see them on real estate, but of course there's other options out there for you, but we also do see assignments, joint ventures, and we'll have an example of that in just a little bit, and accounts receivable, so purchasing, um, you know, notes that haven't been paid on in a while at a discount, and then um, having the those notes either um, get them reperforming or maybe sell them or foreclose on the note, depending on what the, the, um, the asset is underlying on that note. So there's a lot of different options for the paper side of assets. And if you don't wanna worry about tenants, toilets, and termites, but you wanna be involved in real estate and other investments, that might be a way for you to do that. 
We also do see people invest in LLCs, and there's a couple different ways that we see LLCs at Advana. It could be a single member LLC for what we call checkbook control. So if you've heard of a checkbook IRA or checkbook control of an IRA, then you might be familiar with this concept, but basically establishing a brand new LLC for the purpose of the IRA, having the IRA invest in the LLC or buy 100% of the shares, and then owning that LLC really just as a tool to gain checkbook control. So that LLC just by nature of it will have a checking account. And now the IRA holder can use that LLC, fund it with their IRA money and use that LLC to make investments. And it could be real estate, it could be private lending, it could be cryptocurrency, gold and silver bars and coins, it could be invested in limited partnerships. And really the list goes on and on and on. And of course, another way we see IRAs invest in LLCs would be um, investing in other people's companies. So subscribing to an offering out there and available for IRAs to invest. We have seen people invest in farm animals. I personally have seen people invest in cattle, alpaca, racehorses. So, you know, here is where we're looking at the aspect of a self-directed IRA where you can really invest in what you know best is what we like to say. And so if you really don't understand real estate or the stock market or you're not interested in those things, but you understand things like raising racehorses and what it takes for a racehorse to be trained and things of that nature, then we have seen clients invest into LLCs for racehorses. We've seen partnerships, of course, in movie projects. We actually had a local movie project raising capital here in the Tampa Bay area several years ago now, and um, they were raising capital and allowing IRAs to participate. So we have seen that. Precious metals, gold, silver bars, and coins, crypto, um, excuse me, also cryptocurrencies, of course, but gold and silver bars and coins, platinum, palladium. There's a lot of options out there for precious metals. We have seen equipment leasing. So things like farm equipment, we've seen large format printers, ATM machines. There's a lot of options there as well. Foreign currency trading accounts or Forex accounts as they're commonly called. Private stock, so there's a lot of local restaurants and breweries that are considered private stock and our clients have invested in those. And then of course, commodities and oil and gas. And when we are talking about a self-directed IRA, I know that Alex mentioned, you know, brokerage firms have their own options for a self-directed IRA, but what we hold, we really truly consider self-directed, meaning that you're going out there, you're finding the investment, you're very entrepreneurial here and putting your money to work for you. And so it's going to mean anything outside of the market. But moving money to a self-directed IRA is actually really easy when um, you're looking at transferring money, what you want to do is just let us know where that money is coming over from, and then we're going to tell you what that process looks like. So for example, if you're moving from IRA to IRA, then that's just what we consider a trustee to trustee transfer. There's some paperwork for you to fill out on our end, and then we actually submit it on your behalf over to your other custodian request that they send the amount of money you're requesting. The good news is this is not an all or nothing strategy. You can move over just the amount you want to self-direct, and that would be pretty typical. If you had a deal where you were going to lend $50,000 out of your IRA, you could literally just move $50,000 over, pay your fees with a credit card, and then make that investment so that you don't have any uninvested cash sitting with advantage. You certainly don't have to. Another way to move money would be from like an old employer plan. That's called a direct rollover. And when you're doing a direct rollover, you do fill out a form with Advanta, but you actually reach out to the administrator for the 401k or 403b or TSP, whatever it might be, and request the rollover with them. They'll want some information from you, the name of your account, how to make the check payable, the new account number. Once that's provided to them, they'll send the money over to Advanta on your behalf. Typically, they're going to mail a check to you actually made payable to your new IRA, and then you would forward it to us. That's not always the process, but that's pretty typical. And then, of course, the third way of moving money is something that we don't see as often. It's considered an indirect rollover. It's when you've taken a distribution from a retirement account, whether it's a 401k or an IRA, you have 60 days, not two months, 60 days to get that money back into a retirement account to avoid taxes and penalties. And every once in a while, we do see people moving money by direct rollover. The only thing about that is if you fail to get the money back into a retirement account within that 60 days, it is taxable and potentially penalized depending on your age and the type of account that you have. So just be aware of that.
And I did see some questions pop up. Um, is there a service available um, where we help with selecting investments? We really don't help you select investments. And that kind of goes back to the fact that it's a self-directed IRA and we are not advisors. We really do not give any investment advice at all. We're sort of limited to educating on the types of investments that you can make. And we do that through our educational platforms like our webinars, our podcast, and our blog articles. If you have specific questions about what might be allowed, we certainly can look at an investment structure um, that you're thinking about and go going over that with you and talking to you about why it may or may not be allowed. But ultimately, understanding the rules is going to be super important for a self-directed IRA. I had another question pop up about, about holding real estate and whether or not you can do it in your individual name or in an LLC. Um, the, uh, it would be in the name of the IRA or it could be in the name of an LLC or you could even use a trust here. Um, it could be a land trust or a personal property trust. It wouldn't be in your personal name. It would be Advanta IRA Services, LLC, FBO, and then your name and your account number. You can certainly leave your name off if you prefer to just have your account number on there, but um, that would be a way to avoid having your name listed. Um, or you can use an LLC, so that checkbook control I mentioned earlier um, would also be a way to do that. Um, and then additional to the question was, um, is there a way to get an IRA to then leverage? And there is it, it is possible to borrow with an IRA. I'm not gonna get into that right now because we do actually have an example of that um, at the end of the webinar, so we'll talk about that also. We had a question pop up if you could do a partial rollover to a solo 401k. Um, and can it be in the same account as, a, as Trust Company 1 and Trust Company 2 for the plan? I'm not sure what you're referring to there, but you can certainly do a partial rollover but it is going to depend on your 401k plan administrator. So if you have a plan um, with like a W-2, so you're employed by somebody else and you have a 401k and you want to roll over money to a solo 401k because you're also self-employed, you could potentially do that. It's going to depend on the 401k with your plan administrator and your current job as to whether or not they allow you to do an in-service distribution for rollover. Um, if you're looking to roll over money from a solo 401k into a self-directed IRA, again, it's going to depend on the plan, your age, and whether the plan allows you to. So I'm not sure if I answered your question there, but you can certainly reach out to directly if you have more questions on that. Um, can you direct deposit funds um, from your payroll to a self-directed IRA? You can, but you're going to just want to keep in mind that you're going to be limited on your contributions based on the type of account that you have. And you also want to check with your payroll company to see if they will help you with that. Um, just keep in mind that Advanta can't pull front funds from any account. Um, and so it will be up to you or the payroll company to push money over. Um, typically, we don't see payroll companies do that. We normally would see a client set us up almost like a bill pay with their bank so that they're making their annual contribution spread out over the 12 month period. And again, you're just gonna be limited based on the type of account. So if it's, for example, a Roth or a traditional, it's gonna be 6,500 or 7,500 um, if you're over the age of 50. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about the rules and how they work within a self-directed IRA, just keeping in mind um, that usually if you're making an investment for investment purposes, that's the kind of thing that the IRS likes to be likes to see things that are considered arm's length or with third parties investments that don't benefit you currently. So, you know, if you said, well, I'm going to buy one, two, three Main Street, but I want to use it as a vacation home once a year, that would be prohibited. So the IRS says that you can't transact with disqualified people. And I have a table coming up showing you who those people are and that you can't have a current benefit for yourself or those disqualified persons. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. There's only two prohibited investments within a self-directed IRA, and those two prohibited investments are life insurance and collectibles. And we talk about coins as a collectible, and so you would really be able to tell, and actually the IRS will, does have a list on their website of coins that are allowed, but if the coin's value is based on it being rare, or antique, then it's gonna be something that you can't hold in an IRA. But if its value is based on what the metal is trading at, then that is gonna be something typically you could hold in an IRA. Um, remember again, prohibited transactions are transactions between your IRA and a disqualified person. And again, a current benefit 
to a disqualified person when your IRA is involved. Um, and you can find information on that in section 4975 of on irs.gov, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. And then something you should be aware of, this does not make your transaction prohibited, but you're going to have some more moving parts when you're exposing your IRA to unrelated business income tax or unrela unrelated debt finance income tax. So unrelated Unrelated business income tax occurs in an IRA account when business income applies to the investment that you're making. And we're not talking about passive income, things like dividends, interest income. That isn't going to typically be something that generates unrelated business income tax, or it's commonly referred to as UBIT. But if you invest into a business and you are going to have business income return to the IRA, then that's the time to talk to your CPA about UBIT and how that might apply to your IRA. And then the other time there's a tax, and these are the only two times you'll see a tax apply to an IRA, would be when you use financing to purchase real estate in an IRA account. So Unrelated debt finance income generates unrelated business income tax. And what happens is the amount you borrow, the, um, excuse me, the amount, the income related to the amount you borrow is going to be taxable. So if I borrow 50% when I'm purchasing a rental property, then 50% of my income is going to be exposed to UDFI or UBIT. And we have an example of that. But just be aware, again, these things do not make the investment prohibited or something that you can't do. It's just some more moving parts that you should be aware of so that when you're making the investment, you're aware of everything that applies here and you can really make the most informed decision. The IRA would have to file an additional tax form if it applies. It's called 990T. When it comes to unrelated debt finance income tax, there are some potential to get some deductions before paying that tax and the tax is paid by the IRA. So that's important. It's not a tax burden to you, it's a tax burden to your IRA account. Here's that table I mentioned. You can see here who the disqualified persons are. So you have the IRA holder is a disqualified person from transacting with their IRA, meaning with an IRA, you can't borrow from it, you can't sell a property to it or buy a property from it, you can't rent from your IRA, and so that kind of gives you an idea of some transactions. Other disqualified persons are going to be your spouse, your parents, your grandparents, your children, your grandchildren, and then any spouses or business entities of those. So sometimes people ask us about, you know, personal rental property that they own, and this would be a perfect one for the IRA. And good news, it's in an LLC, so I can just transfer the LLC over to the IRA. And unfortunately, it just does not work that way. The IRA has to make a new to you and new to itself investment from the outset in order to purchase that investment. So please keep that in mind. Again, an investment for investment purposes with no current benefit to those listed here. So people up and down um, your lineal tree. And we did have some questions pop up here um, that we can um, address before we move on. Um, what taxes and penalties are there for leaving money in a 401k and not moving the funds to a self-directed IRA? Um, there aren't any taxes and penalties if you're leaving money in the 401k. Um, and if you're no longer employed by that administrator, at some point they might kick it over to an IRA. Um, but if they are, they would have to notify you before they do that. And some plan administrators will just let you leave money in the 401k. And when you're at retirement age, you can start taking distributions. So um, you know, that's really maybe a question to talk to your CPA about if you're looking to move money from the 401k or if you just want to leave it there um, and you are old enough, over 59 and a half, to start taking distributions. Um, but there, there isn't really a penalty or taxes paid while the money's still sitting in a retirement account. Um, we had another question pop up when selling property that was purchased with a self-directed IRA, can you pull cash from the sale of the property without penalties? The answer to that is, is it depends. It depends on how old you are. Um, and what's going to happen is when you sell that property, let's say that you purchased the property 10 years ago for $150,000 and you're selling it today for $300,000, all of the proceeds from the sale are going to go directly back to the self-directed IRA that IRA made the purchase, the money has to go back to the IRA. 
But then if you're over the age of 59 and a half, you can take a distribution for whatever amount you want and that amount will be tax, or excuse me, that amount will be penalty free. Whether or not it's taxed is gonna depend on its status. So is it a qualified Roth IRA, meaning it's aged for five years plus you're over the age of 59 and a half? Um, or is it a traditional IRA? And if it's a traditional IRA, of course, it's going to be taxed at ordinary income, but it will be penalty free as long as you're over 59 and a half. If you're under 59 and a half, you're going to pay penalties and then um, tax as well. So just be aware of how those distribution rules work. Here's some examples of prohibited transactions, and we talked a little bit about this, so selling, exchanging, or leasing property. Remember, this should be a new to you, new to the IRA investment. Um, lending money or extending credit, so you cannot give a personal guarantee or extend your personal credit for your IRA. So we, we are going to talk about an example of borrowing when you're purchasing real estate in an IRA, but that loan has to be considered non-recourse. And that's very important because that non-recourse status is what allows the, what the IRS requires to allow you to borrow when you're making an investment in real estate um, through a retirement account. Um, furnishing good services or facilities. Remember that the only contribution you can make to an IRA is monetary. So taking money out of your personal bank account and contributing it to your IRA, you're going to be limited to the amounts um, based on the type of account you have and the year. So we talked about 6,500 or 7,500 for traditional and Roth IRAs for 2023. So that's the contribution limit. And the IRS says that you cannot provide sweat equity to an IRA because it is not a cash contribution based on the limits allowed. So keep that in mind. If you buy a rental property, you can't go out and swing a hammer, paint the door, lay the carpet, um, things of that nature. So you just wanna make sure that you're not providing sweat equity for IRA owned assets. And that's very important. No self-dealing and no personal use. All righty, Larissa, thank you very much for all of that. I'm going to take it over here for the next few slides. Just want to clear out. Uh, you did get through the last of the questions. All right, just make sure those are clear. All right, private lending basics, what y'all signed up to learn about. So let's get right into it. So there's a lot of different types of lending. When someone says to lend money, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. The nice thing about IRAs and kind of what Larissa was getting at as well with the regulations on what you can and can't on what you can and can't do is that the IRS really kind of leaves it up to you. So long as that you're not lending to a disqualified individual, so mother, father, son, daughter, or spouse, or yourself, you can really kind of, you know, make the terms what you want to. And the nice thing about lending is that you can kind of pick your rate of return as well. And we'll get into that in a minute. But the typical types of lending that we see are listed right up here. So let's get into it. You can do traditional mortgage lending. You could lend someone money for 15, 30 years. You could do it for a 5-1, which is a five year with an adjustable rate. You could even have a balloon listed on the note. So you could say, hey, we're gonna lend you out money at 7% with a five year balloon. Or you could even do something where you have, in lieu of interest, you have something like equity participation, which is one of the things that I've never even heard about before I, start, before I started working at Advanta. It was one of the really interesting things that I kind of came across. So the way that would work is that let's say you lend someone money for a rehab project. Now that rehabber is, you know, and definitely wants to get that property done and allowing them to maybe instead of making payments or giving them effectively a 0% interest would allow them to use more of the capital that you lent them to get the project done quicker and hopefully take advantage of a hot market and get a higher price. Well, most people would be asking, well, why would I ever lend someone money and not get interest or let them not make payments? Well, what equity participation would allow for is that written into the note would allow for your IRA to collect a certain percentage of the profits at sale. So let's say instead of charging someone 10, 15, 8, whatever the percentage on the note would be, you charge them, let's say, 1 or 0% interest and then say, you know what, I'm going to collect 20% of the profits at sale. So maybe you lent them $100,000 and then they sold the property for two hundred. dollars Well, then you would get a $20,000 check plus your $100,000 once it's sold. Now, that's a 20% return on your investment, which is pretty nice. Now, granted, that's just a fictitious number I pulled out of thin air. But, you know, it kind of goes to show that you can be very flexible with how 
you actually structure these things. You can make the deal work for you or your IRA, I should say, and the ultimate end use borrower, which is a really powerful tool because when people go to banks, you know, they're at the mercy of the bank saying, hey, Mr. Banker, I need, you know, this much money for that long. And they say, well, here's the products we have. You can customize this stuff to make a deal work as best as possible, which is one of the really cool things about self-directed. You're not beholden to anyone else besides a few IRS regulations other than yourself and your your thoughts and, you know, comfortability with making the investment and what the ultimate end user needs. Now, again, mortgage lending is nice because of the, you know, hopefully – uh, bad situation of the borrower not paying the IRA back happens, you have a piece of collateral that you could foreclose and take. Now, mortgages most often assumed is, you know, you're looking at a piece of real estate. And while that certainly is the most common use case for a mortgage, you could record security or record a mortgage against almost anything. Uh, it could be things like uh, Larissa said, like large format printers or rolling equipment or accounts receivable or even things like private stock or a stock portfolio. Almost anything can be used as collateral, and it gives you that extra layer of security. Now, some people say, you know, that's all well and good, but maybe I want to, you know, charge, you know, maybe I want to swing for the fences more, do something a little bit more risky with a little bit more reward attached to it. Well, that's where you see things like unsecured notes coming in, where you're lending someone money on a more personal basis, and in the event of default, ultimately your IRA would have to sue them to recover. But with that additional risk comes the ability to charge higher interest rates and potentially make more money. Now, you do need to be cognizant of rules which are called usury, uh, which is a tough one to say five times fast. But basically what usury laws are in place to do is it caps the maximum amount of interest that you can charge on a promissory note. Now, these vary by state to state. There are 50 different flavors and 51 if you include the District of Columbia. Uh, different flavors of usury laws in the United States. And sometimes they even vary locally as well. So while it's all well and good for me to say, hey, there's a maximum amount of interest you might be able to charge, I have no idea what that's going to be for your specific use case. States vary widely. Typically, you know, a benchmark is somewhere around the like 18 to 30 percent range is what a lot of them are. Some of them you can't charge over 100. Some of them you Again, it's all over the place. The important part about that is to check with the, an attorney or someone familiar with your local uh, rules and regulations. And there's also no restriction on how long the money can go out for. You can potentially lend someone money for, you know, two weeks. You could do more transactional funding or gap funding. You could lend someone money for 20, 30. I've seen 50-year mortgages. Um, I think the big, longest one I saw was an 80-year loan uh, that had a lot of other creative stuff uh, packaged into it. But um, you know, needless to say, there are a lot of different ways to do this. And again, you know, kind of the, the sky's limit and your creativity is really the only thing that's going to limit you in what you can do or not do um, with the type of structure you bake into these notes. Now, I said beginning in the last slide that the cool thing is, is that you kind of get to pick your rate of return. So you get to kind of with these, you get to pick to an extent your risk tolerance, whether or not you're going to be lending with a secured note, uh, if that's going to be a first position mortgage or a second position mortgage, or if you're going to lend unsecured, what the type of collateral is. You're also going to choose your rate of return, which is something where you don't really get to do that with almost any other type of asset class. You buy something typically and you're just hoping for appreciation or cash flow. With a promissory note, you get to choose how much money you're going to be making on this. And then sometimes, you know, especially with equity participation, you know, yes, that might fluctuate some, but the nice thing is, is that, again, you get to pick your ROI on this. You also get to pick the amount of money you lend out. You get to pick the interest rate. You get to pick the period of the loan, so how long that that loan is going to be out for. You also get to pick, you know, if there's any additional terms and when the person has to pay you. You could say, hey, you know what, this maybe is a little bit riskier. I want biweekly payments. Or you could say, hey, I want weekly payments. Or you could do monthly, you know, bi-monthly, biannually, annually, every two years. You, you get to pick all these different parts about the actual investment. And that's something that I find very interesting and also that it's specifically unique to lending is that you get to pick all this stuff. You know, you don't just buy a stock and say, you know what, I'm pretty sure the trajectory of this company and their product's going to raise the stock price. Or you buy a piece of rental property and you say, okay, great, the rents in this area are good, but something bad happens and the rents go down. You don't really have any control over any of that stuff. But with mortgage lending, or lending in general, you do. So again, one of the really cool aspects and one of the really attractive aspects to borrowing or lending within an IRA. Again, I think we've kind of covered this, but we'll certainly go through in a little bit more detail. You get to determine the terms, 
the rate at which your IRA grows. One thing I didn't touch on is the liability aspect of this. And to steal a quote from a, a good friend of Advana and a very well-respected uh, investor, uh, Pete Fortunato, when someone walks into a house and they trip and fall and break their arm or, you know, God forbid, something worse, you know, they don't trip over the, the piece of paper that's the mortgage. They trip over the loose floorboard or the uh, <laughs> unsecured strike plate. They sue the owner of the property. The nice thing about being the, the lender in a, in a property is that you get the benefits of being invested in, you know, a real estate adjacent product or secured piece of real estate to your note. But you don't have the liability of dealing with, again, things like tenants, termites, taxes, insurance. You've lent the money to the individual owning it, and you have a secured interest in it, and the likelihood that your IRA would get sued is very minimal. Now, I would never say your IRA, you can't get sued being the mortgage lender because of the society we live in, and obviously, <laughs> you know, something hasn't happened doesn't mean that it can't happen is that you know you certainly do potentially have a significantly reduced liability exposure by being the lender in a project. And that's especially important for an IRA because unlike getting sued personally, uh, if the IRA were to own a property, the IRA actually has to get represented in court, which can get expensive. And the IRA is due to pay any and all legal bills associated with the lawsuit. So while your IRA might own the property, and let's say you might have you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars left in your retirement plan. Thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars doesn't get you very far in, you know, a libel, a libelous lawsuit. So just keep that in mind. You know, you can't float those bills personally. So especially with IRAs, the attractiveness of lending not only for the ability to set things like the interest rate, the collateral, all those different things, the reduction in potential liability exposure, you know, is also very attractive. And that kind of also leads into the asset maintenance cost. If you buy a piece of real estate directly, you got to put on a new roof. You got your IRA has to pay for that. Plumbing leak, you might have to pay for a rehype. The cost of it sitting vacant, or you know, turning around for tenants. All those things are carrying costs that you have to that you, your IRA is going to have to float if it owns the property directly. All of those things go out the window when you have a note in your IRA instead of the property directly. So your maintenance costs for the actual asset can be significantly less. Again, that just depends on the type of type of real estate. You know, if you bought something that a piece of real estate that had absolutely zero issues with it, yeah, your car carrying costs are going to be pretty low. But, you know, you know, in the normal course of buying any piece of real estate, things are going to happen. Uh, you know, there's going to be a small leak. You're going to have to replace some carpet or you know, paint the wall. So, again, the the cost associated with owning real estate uh, for an IRA uh, versus lending on something, again, makes it a very attractive option. And also the ability to partner your funds with other individuals is a lot easier with a note because of the reduced interaction and kind of activity levels with doing a mortgage loan. Um, again, you kind of set it and forget it. Again, not that I encourage anyone to just forget about their investment or not track it, but once you've actually issued the funds out to the borrower, there's really not a whole lot else that goes on on the back end except for just collecting in those payments. So the ability to have multiple people partnered on one loan is a lot easier than doing that on a piece of real estate where there's a lot more ongoing maintenance uh, expenses, interactions with the investment, things like that. Um, okay, and then we're going to get into case studies. I'm going to do the first case study. Before we get into the case study, um, all right, let's Looks like Larissa has been keeping up with the question. Correct, Larissa? Yes, Alex. And actually, I did have one, though, that I think we could address for the group because there was a question on sample documents and whether or not Advanta would provide uh, sample documents. And, and actually, we don't. We don't have any sample documents to provide. All of the documentation that we receive are directly from clients for specific deals. And so there isn't a sample for us to provide. Um, something that um, we would recommend, of course, is talking to an attorney about documents, or you can also talk to a title agent if you're looking to do you know, something like a mortgage loan or a deed of trust, um, you know, those professionals would absolutely be able to help you. And really for a self-directed IRA, if they're unfamiliar with working with a self-directed IRA, we can provide some information that they would need. So for example, the borrower being the IRA or the 401k in this case, and what information we need to see on the note in order to show the IRA as the investor. 
Um, but also um, certainly speaking with attorneys that have worked with our clients before, and we'd certainly be healthy, happy to give you those names um, if you needed some professionals. But of course, you can start with your own professionals in your area and talk to them about um, potentially lending from an IRA and if they would put those loan documents together for you. Yeah, and also I would say too that there's a plethora. I mean, I, I'm always of the opinion that people, you know, dealing with, you know, some, someone with a pulse on the other end of the line is always preferable, especially if it's your first shake at something. Uh, there's plenty of online resources as well, but, um, you know, it's cheap insurance to pay maybe a couple hundred bucks to ensure that you have good, proper documentation, something that would hold up in court if the worst thing happens when you lend your hard earned retirement money out. Because the last thing you want to do is lend it to someone. You know, something happens, they abscond with it. You know, the worst happens. You know, not all deals work out. We always hope that they do. But if the worst were to happen, you need to go to court. You don't want to have something that a judge looks at and goes, well, this document is in no way, shape, or form good enough to, you know, support a lawsuit. Um, so, again, you know, making sure you have good documents. And then one question that popped up while Arista was uh, giving that great answer was, uh, can I lend money for an automobile while the money is already invested in bonds? Well, a few things with that question. One, I mean, not really, because the money has, you know, how are you going to lend the money out if it's invested in bonds? You have to have the cash to, in the IRA to lend. So you might need to redeem some of those bonds um, or just use available cash in the, uh, in the account. Um, specifically to lending on an automobile, it gets into not necessarily a prohibited transaction per se, although there is some arguments to be made, you know, lending on a, uh, you know, 457 Hemi, uh, you know, like a 69 uh, Chevelle or something, uh, you know, something that is definitely collectible. And you can make the case that, you know, if you were to have to foreclose on it, then you'd have or repossess it, you would have an issue with prohibited item. Uh, but having something, even if it were prohibited as collateral, isn't necessarily the issue per se. Um, but the bigger issue with automobiles comes in the fact of one, you know, when you go to title it, um, if you've looked at any title in any state, normally it'll list the lien holder. One is making sure that the IRA is properly listed as the lien holder on there. But two, if you ever were to have to foreclose, and let's just say you lent someone money and this, and you held the note on uh, a bunch of work trucks. You know, let's just say you had single cab, long bed, F-150s that someone was using for, you know, construction, whatever it was, and you had to fork and you had to repossess those. Well. One, it's going to be kind of tough and expensive to actually repo those because one, you couldn't personally utilize them or drive them. Two, you would have to pay to have them stored. You couldn't store them on your own personal property or do any work on them. And then, you know, cars are just kind of a hands-on item, you know, for the most part. So while could you lend on and have the security be, um, you know, a lien on an automobile? Yes, functionally you could do that. But there's definitely a lot of considerations to give on the back end to say, hey, you know, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to be just, you know, kind of a nightmare of the operational things on how to even go about, you know, doing anything. So, again, things can get complex when it's, you know, not kind of your just normal real estate or more commonly lent to things out of IRAs. Not to say you can't do it, but, you know, it's uh, just some things to consider down the road uh, if you're looking to do something like that, especially with uh, money. And Alex, before you have uh, before you go on, there was another question that popped up about um, how interest earned on loans in a 401k would apply and um, would advance to provide tax documents for a CPA. We don't provide any tax documents, but certainly you can um, you have access to your statement. We could send you a statement on the interest paid through the year. But when you're earning interest, this is really just going to be earnings to your retirement account. So it's going to be treated as such. So Alex, I don't know if you have anything you want to add there, but really it's just money going back to your retirement account to grow, continue to grow tax deferred or tax free, depending on the status or type of retirement account. Yeah. The only thing I would add to that is maybe that they're maybe getting at, um, you know, if you're, if you're lending out on a first position mortgage, um, are, are the IRAs or are we issuing IRS form 1098 INT? Uh, we're not going to issue a 1098, um, which is the form used to deduct interest payments on a loan to real property. Uh, they're not terribly hard forms to file any CPA or, you know, if you can, you know, punch in the payer's information, you can certainly provide one to your borrower. But that's not something that we at Advanta would do. And of course, everything that Larissa said as far as the uh, interest being received by the 401k or IRA, uh, you know, that's all 100% true. But um, on the, on the, borrower side, the payor side, 
um, we're not going to issue any type of 1098 for them to write off the interest on the uh, on the interest on the property. Uh, so that's really the only thing I would add to that as well. Okay, um, great. Thanks, Alex. That's a good point. Um, and then we did have one other question pop up that I think applies to the group as a whole. Um, if the flop, if a flipper uses other debt financing besides what you provide, would that trigger UBIT? And not in this case where you're a lender, because you're lending money. If they get a second mortgage or a third mortgage or unsecured that they're using to finish up the rehab project, you're still just the lender in this case. And so that doesn't apply to you. It would be different if you were, um, you know, maybe uh, if your IRA was on the deed in some way, you know, maybe for a joint venture agreement or something like that, depending on the structure of the deal. If you were on the deed and the flipper is getting a, a mortgage on that property, then UBIT is going to apply. But if you are just simply the lender, first position, second position, third position, it doesn't matter here, um, then the unrelated business income tax does not apply. Yeah, good point, Larissa. And keep in mind that uh, I saw a few raised hands. Um, we don't necessarily address the raised hand, just uh, type in the question and then we'll get to those um, as they pop up. So, uh, oh, one sec. Um, the last question, uh, using the example in case number one, what would be the expenses that, uh, yeah, if you have questions regarding um, uh, fees, it's a little bit easier for you to just uh, fire those over to us separately because while our fees are relatively uniform, it's a lot easier for us to give you a very accurate number if you just reach out to us directly. Um, so, going on. There we go. First case study. All right. In this one, we have our gentleman, Paul, IRA. He's got 120 grand in IRA and wants to get more consistent terms. Again, going back to the fact that you can name all the details of this loan so long as you're not violating any laws. Uh, you get to kind of write your own book with this. So Paul meets a private mortgage broker who can place his IRA funds with a first mortgage with a qualified borrower. And that's important, especially if you're lending to an owner-occupied uh, uh, property. you got to deal with things like Dodd-Frank. You're not exempt from any of those uh, uh, federal regulations. So if you're going to lend to anything that's owner-occupied, I'd highly recommend that you get it properly originated through a mortgage loan originator. Uh, but if you're lending, let's Ooh, lending to non-owner occupied property, uh, lending to an investor, a flipper, something like that. Again, not that you don't have to worry about any of that stuff, but the uh, the burdensome regulations are significantly reduced. But again, I always recommend talk to a, a certified attorney, mortgage broker, make sure you're not violating anything that's going to come back to bite you in the end. Um, but in this case, Paul vets the property and the borrower and agrees to the loan terms. So what do the terms look like? 120 grand, interest rate 8%, five year balloon, monthly payments of $800, secured by a first mortgage on the property, meaning that he is the first in line of the creditors on the property to get paid. So if there's a second mortgage, he gets paid first, then the next one would. The only things that kind of supersede that are things like, um, you know, HOAs, taxes, uh, you know, mechanics liens, things like that would supersede your debt in a lawsuit. But again, first position, is going to be the most secure, the first one to get paid out. So again, this is why, you know, being, understanding where your debt falls in line, just because you have a mortgage on the property, they're not all created equal. Yes, a person could give you a mortgage on the property, but if you're in fifth position, then <laughs> good luck if there's ever any issues. But um, in this case, Paul's got a first position on the property, 120 grand, 8%, five-year balloon, $800 a month coming in. So what happens when? Now, this is where a lot of people get, uh, tripped up. And especially when I was administering clients directly and doing investments for clients, the biggest thing for people in self-direction is not necessarily putting together the deal. Most people come in either with a baseline understanding because they've done lending outside their IRA, they've done property purchases, they've done whatever they, they're doing in the IRA already. They get tripped up on the relatively easy stuff, but easy, easy stuff to miss when it comes to the front end and getting stuff done correctly. So the first thing you got to do is open an account. I know it sounds, you know, kind of easy and, and relatively elementary, but you would be very surprised how many times I've gotten a call from people saying, hey, you know, we're trying to close on this property next week. I want to lend the money. I need to get the account open. And I have to say, well, well, maybe, <laughs> you know, we don't have yet, even have an account or money over here yet. Um, and these things can take a little time. So the first thing to do if you want to do this kind of stuff is open the account. Um, you know, get the process started of getting the money transferred over because that can take anywhere from five uh, to up to 15 to 20 business days, depending on who the other custodian is. Um, so just keep that in mind. It can be quick, it can be a little bit longer, but getting the process started sooner will get you to the point where you have money here and cleared, ready to make the investment and ready to make the closing deadline. So in this case, Paul opens the Advanta IRA account. First thing you got to do, 
He finds a loan to make and he analyzes the terms during the time in which the funds are being transferred. He makes the offer to Lynn, gets the terms accepted. He reaches out to his dedicated account manager here at Advanta, says, hey, you know what? Paul, or Paul reaches out to us and says, hey, you know what, Brett? I'm, I'm ready to make the investment. Uh, let's go for it. Puts us in contact with the attorney handling all the docs and then we get everything sorted out, send everything to Paul for approval, and ultimately then we fund the investment. So that's what Paul does. He negotiates everything, gets the account open, lets us know, and then approves all of the documents before funding. What do we do in this scenario? We review all of the documents to make sure that the IRA is properly vested. We don't review them for any type of compliance or other type of legal aspects. So we just review it to make sure that the IRA is, yep, properly titled on it. Everything is copacetic with regard to the IRA actually holding this as an investment. We get Paul's approval before we send any money out. We don't really need to execute anything in a loan agreement, typically. Um, and then we wire the funds, the 120000 to the closing agent. The mortgage is recorded and the uh, the note and mortgage are recorded. And then the original recorded mortgage is sent to Advanta for safekeeping. And at that point, the investment is done. So uh, after the close, the borrower sends the monthly interest directly to Advanta. Again. Paul's not paying any, any income tax on this. It's going directly back into the IRA. Uh, Paul can log in online, check his statements, make sure the borrower is paying. Keep in mind, what I tell people is that we're not going to reach out to the borrower or reach out to you directly saying, hey, someone has not deposited money. You can use the absence of any type of notification of, from us from a, for a deposit as an indication that someone has not paid to your IRA account. So while we don't necessarily send you an email saying, hey, you know, your borrower hasn't paid you. If you don't get that notification from us saying, hey, a, a deposit's been made, you know they haven't been paying. You can also check it online. Um, you know, just like you would check to see if your paycheck has hit your account on a certain day, logging into your uh, bank's website. Same thing with Advanta. Just log in, check, see if they've made the payment. Uh, so we try to make this as easy as possible. So again, in this scenario, hopefully all investments run a good course. And when it comes to fruition, three years later, the borrower decides to sell the house needs to repay back that debt. So the IRA receives $120,000 at sale. Paul's IRA made $28,800 in interest, which is 800 times 36 payments during the life of the loan. None of those are taxed to capital gains. And now Paul has $148,800 after three years of investing um, to then in turn go out and reinvest and continue to rinse, wash, and repeat and hopefully uh, make some more great returns with his IRA. Uh, now, Larissa is going to be covering the second case study, and then we will get you out of here. Uh, we had a question pop up. Uh, would REIT dividends go directly into my Advanta IRA? Well, that's assuming that the IRA owned those shares of the REIT, in which case, yes. But if you own that personally, no. But if your IRA invests into a REIT, which is a real estate investment trust, then yes, it would go directly back into your Advanta account. With that said, I'll turn it over to Larissa to uh, uh, do the next case study. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, and we had one more question pop up. Does UBIT get triggered by an equity participation participation note when the borrower uses leverage? It, again, is going to depend on the structure for this. Um, if the IRA is on the deed and therefore, you know, that real estate is being leveraged and the IRA is participating in that way, then it, it very likely does. Um, Alex, I know you've handled more transactions. Have you seen equity participation where the IRA is also part of the the buyer in a real estate deal for a joint venture or an equity deal in that way? I mean, would you ever get triggered by equity participation when a note when the borrower uses leverage? I mean, I don't. It, it, my, again, this is just me speaking into the ether. That doesn't necessarily cause an issue for me because the IRA isn't an equitable owner of the property. It has a secured interest and it definitely has an interest in the sale of the property, but the property is already encumbered by the IRA. Um, so, you know, the, just like an IRA could be in second position with additional debt, and I haven't seen clients have an issue with that. Again, I have to very heavily emphasize check with tax and legal counsel on this, but again, just speaking anecdotally from what I've seen professionally, haven't seen that cause necessarily an issue. Um, now, if the IRA lent to the person and then also was cut in on the equity participation as a deeded interest owner of the property, uh, then yeah, um, 
there certainly could be an issue. But if the IRA is not on the deed or not listed as an equitable owner of an LLC or a trust that also had an equity ownership in the property, then I don't see necessarily an issue. With it. But to double double down on it, check with tax and legal counsel. But that's just kind of how I see it. Mm -hmm. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And we do have a um, an example of an equity partnership for um, case study two. Um, basically, again, keeping in mind that structure of the investment is your own. And so when you're looking at making an investment, make sure you understand and feel comfortable with this investment, looking at all of the documents that pertain to the investment itself and talking with um, tax and professional um, individuals that they can assist you. If your CPA um, isn't really sure they can assist you, um, you can certainly reach out to an attorney, um, a real estate attorney that can help you with these deals and help you structure these deals as well in a way that makes sense for your IRA. So in this example, Andrea has 150,000 in an IRA and she wants to um, partner with a rehabber to flip a property. She meets Steve at a local investment um, group and Steve has a project that still needs funding. So um, Andrea does her due diligence. Remember, not only on Steve, but also on the property. So even though Steve says to her, hey, when I flip this property, I'm going to make 150000 Andrea wants to make sure she's doing her due diligence, not only on the borrower, but also on the property. So should she have to foreclose, she's recouping her investment. Um, Steve agrees to use the property for collateral and use some of his own funds as a down payment. And Andrea agrees to lend him the rest of the funds from her IRA amount. The loan amount includes the funds to purchase and rehab the property. And remember, these points in this case study are really just to give you an idea of what this would sort of look like. But whatever your terms are, that's got to be something that you're comfortable with with your borrower or if you're the lender or whatever it might be, whatever role you take in this, um, make sure that you're comfortable with the deal. So the loan amount is 125000 as an interest rate of 5%. And I know that sounds low. Sometimes we do see um, high interest rates on equity participation. And sometimes it's a little lower because they're going to receive a share of the profits, which is the case here. So a third of the profits will go back to Andrea's IRA after a, a two-year balloon note. Monthly payment is $520. And Andrea is happy with the security being a first mortgage on the property. Andrea's attorney prepares the note and mortgage. She reads and approves all of the documents with her signature for Advanta, and Advanta IRA holds the note and mortgage on behalf of Andrea. When the note is ready to pay off, um, Steve is going to let Andrea know she's going to work with her attorney for um, any information that's needed for the payoff, and ultimately that will come directly to Advanta. Andrea um, is the um, is going to provide that payoff letter that Steve is looking for, so that's important, and it is sent to the title company that's handling the closing or of course the um, closing attorney, um, whichever applies. We like to do both Andrea's value here as well as Steve's because we actually have people work with Advanta all the time that are not clients. They send us their lenders and say, hey, lender, did you know that you can use an IRA to make this investment and therefore defer some of the taxes or have the growth become tax-free through the IRA? And so, of course, Andrea was the IRA holder in this case, and she received her repayment of $125,000. The monthly payments totaled in $3,000 in this case, and she got um, her share of the profits, $25,000. So her earnings on this investment were $28,000. Steve's er um, earnings, he borrowed $125,000. He sold the house for $20,000. After repayment of the loan and Andrea's share of the profits and interest of $28,000, he had a total earnings of uh, total earnings of 47,000. So that's both um, the borrower and lender side. And you can see where um, Steve still did pretty good. Andrea did pretty good. So this was a win-win, so to speak, in a deal that Andrea and Steve made you over and over again, which is something we do see a lot at Advanta. We sort of see these partnerships form where the IRA holder is happy to continually lend to a borrower because they're happy with their returns and the passive investing that they're doing in real estate through that borrower. Um, so using non-real estate for collateral, um, this is something that we have seen at Advanta. And so, you know, a lot of times we do talk about mortgages and of course they're tied to real estate, but what does it look like if you're investing in something that is, or you're lending on something that is non-real estate? And it's important again, to get your professional team involved here and talk to an attorney about security and how you would 
recoup your investment if you um, had somebody stop paying on that loan. So if the note, for example, is secured by a prohibited investment, life insurance or collectible, collectible that investment is not prohibited per se because what is the investment in this example? It's the note itself, not the collateral. But what would happen if you had to collect on the debt? So all of a sudden the borrower stops paying, what would you do? And of course you have some options here. There are buyers of um, non-performing notes. You could sell it at a discount and then somebody else could um, collect on that debt. You could. Um, also distribute the note to yourself personally. So having it valued by a professional and distributing that value to yourself personally so that you could personally collect. But just being aware, being aware of the moving parts in this scenario is very important. Um, also, if the note is secured by stock in a company, you wanna check to make sure how that works based on how the uh, company is structured. So for example, IRAs, cannot invest in S Corp. So S corporations cannot have IRAs as shareholders. And so if you lend money to an S Corp and they say, well, this is a convertible note and the IRA can become a shareholder, that is not the case for an S Corp. An S Corp cannot have IRAs as shareholders. So again, just being aware of that. You may subject the IRA to unrelated business income tax. So if you're um, lending and the, um, you're lending on a non-real estate asset that might expose the IRA to business income rather than passive income, which would expose it to UBIT. And again, if you're lending on something that is you know, non-real estate, understand how you file security. So making sure you talk to a CPA about something like a UCC filing or what might apply to this non-real estate collateral. Um, so unsecured lending, um, I'm going to go through this very quickly. I know Alex and I have run over, but I think we had a lot of really great questions that we didn't want to miss for the group. So we're going to go um, continue on. If you if you can't stay with us, this is going to be recorded and it is being recorded and the recording will be sent out, but we're happy to see um, people have stuck with us so far. Um, so in this case study, we're going to talk about unsecured lending. So basically the um, there's going to be a promissory note here, but there's no collateral. And so again, talking with your attorney, if your borrower should stop paying, how would you collect on this debt? So in this loan, uh, Tom decides that he's gonna lend $50,000 to a friend who wants to expand his business and he only needs short-term capital. Tom is gonna lend money from his SEP IRA and he's willing to do it without collateral. Tom drafts the unsecured promissory note and lists the IRA as the lender. The terms are $50,000 going out at an interest rate of 10% with a one-year balloon, and it's a single payment note of $55,000 at the end of the term. Special considerations, considerations, there's no title company involved here, so we require the original signed note in our possession before funding. Since the unsecured lending, since unsecured lending is riskier than conventional mortgages, the interest rate tends to be a little higher. So you're going to see something higher than you would see typically for something secured, of course, by real estate. And just you know, as a note here, we just remind you that credit cards are really a form of unsecured debt. Make sure you know your borrower because it could be difficult to recover if there is a default. So again, you know, just know who you're doing business with. And I'm gonna turn it over to Alex now, but if you have any questions, we are getting to the end of our webinar, so please let us know. Uh, and we're gonna talk about some upcoming events we have at the end as well. Alex? Absolutely. Thank you, Larissa. All right, using financing to buy real estate. So in this deal, Mark has an old 401k with about 160 grand in it, finds a house with 150 that doesn't need much repair work, Mike uses $50,000 from his IRA as a down payment. Now, keep in mind, this is using an IRA to take on debt, kind of a divergence from what we've talked about of your IRA being used to issue debt. So he finds the property, $60,000 from his IRA as a down payment, and finances the rest with a non-recourse loan. So that way he can buy more than one property. Um, in this one, there is a uh, $90,000 loan is what the, what the uh, loan ended up being. 6% fixed rate with a 30 year AM schedule with a monthly payment of $540, so $6,500 in annual payments. 
So here's how exactly a non-recourse debt finance piece of real estate works. I know that's a mouthful, but just so just so we understand, it's what your IRA needs to do in order to borrow money to buy a piece of real estate. He cannot guarantee the note personally. Thus, the bank can only foreclose on the IRA. That's what non-recourse means. It's the bank does not have recourse, meaning the ability to come after him personally for any deficiencies in the value of the property in foreclosure. The loan is to the IRA directly, not to the individual client, and the IRA repays the loan out of the account. So you have to make sure you have enough in reserves to make sure that your loan can be paid from the IRA. And typically lenders want about 30 to 40 percent down with cash reserve. Income received on mortgage real estate is subject to unrelated debt finance income tax, which is UDFI, which is a type of UBIT tax. If you're more interested in learning more about that, I did just teach about an hour and change webinar about two weeks ago. Um, yeah, about two weeks ago on that specific subject. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can find that if you want to learn more about you better. We had some questions coming in with that. Uh, only income based on the percentage of financing is subject to the tax. So it's a ratio of the average <clears throat> uh, loan to value ratio over 12 months of the income received. I know that sounds a little bit uh, <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, Maybe it's not that we've been talking about, but just it's important to understand the basics of this. The IRA needs to file a 990T so they can file the tax return if you're doing debt leverage like this. And taxes paid at trust rates. So here's some of the implications. Uh, with financing, uh, if it's uh, you get $24,000 in rents over the course of a year, loan payments are $6,500. The expenses, 25% uh, of rents is $6,000. Uh, the net amount of prior to UDFI is eleven thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, you have a net income subject to UDFI of sixty nine hundred. UDFI tax of twenty eight percent is nineteen hundred thirty two dollars. And if that's the <coughs> comparative analysis to an all cash purchase in the right hand column. But you also have to keep in mind that this is just one property. Maybe if you had two properties that you were able to buy with the same amount of money. Your after tax or your after you're paying your taxes might be, you know, equal to or double what the person buying just with holy cash would be. And that way you can kind of build on that a little bit quicker. So just because uh, debt can incur taxes with IRAs doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a bad thing. Debt is not always a bad thing. There are taxes always a bad thing. Uh, taxes might be unpleasant, but it certainly can help you get to a, you know, a, a level at which you might want to be at quicker. But again, we just like to include this so people have the uh, contrasting comparison between IRAs lending debt and IRAs taking on debt. So again, I think it's kind of a good thing to have, um, you know, to be illustrated right there. Now, if you're interested in getting started, again, when I did my first case study, I mentioned that the first thing people need to do if you're interested in this is get an account open. That is what's going to take, um, you know, the most amount of time in this whole process of getting funds moved over. The account can be open in 24 to 48 hours. That's easy. It's getting the money over from the other custodian, which is going to take uh, probably the better part of one to two, maybe three weeks. So let's get that process started and we'd be able to be in a position to fund your loan or fund a deal much easier rather than if you kind of wait to do the IRA establishment and funding at the very end. And of course, you start investing uh, to your heart's content. We do like to put on a lot of these great events. We do bi-weekly webinars. I also host a podcast here at Vanta, the Alternative Investing Advantage. And there's a lot of great guests and content. Tomorrow's podcast is going to be on how to set up a pooled investment fund. So if you're someone that has done you know, limited partnerships in commercial real estate and you want kind of the next great step in that, it's going to be how uh, pooled investment funds are set up and managed and operated and giving you an idea of what kind of maybe the next step in that linear progression of a real estate investment trajectory might be. We also catalog all of our great webinars on our YouTube channel, so you can check those out. You can either go to our website, Video On Demand, or our Advanta IRA YouTube page. There are over a thousand different webinars on there, so you can kind of hunt through it to your heart's content, check out stuff from different points in the market cycle, check out stuff that's current, more topical, tons of great guests, great information, and as well as more of our house webinars like this. And we also do maintain an up-to-date blog with industry <clears throat> things going on, such as tax law changes, contribution changes, anything else that might be kind of helpful for you as the investor. With that said, that kind of brings us to the culmination of everything we did have today. My name is Alex Kearney. My awesome co-host Larissa Green is on with us today. Um, I don't have anything else to say except for thank you very much for being on with us. Thank you, Larissa, for being a great co-host as always. And I'll let you end it up here, Larissa, with anything that you have left to say.
Thank you, and thank you to you as well, Alex, and thank you everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. As I mentioned, this is recorded, and the recording will go out either at the end of today or tomorrow, so if you wanted to review it or share it, we would really appreciate that. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>